Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dress and Drinks. I'm Leon Weepers, the host for Costume Society of America. I'm a professor of costume design at Loyola Marymount University, and super excited to have you all here this afternoon and this evening. Um, so thank you for joining us today in our series, Conversations on Dress. And with that, I would love to introduce and welcome to Dress and Drinks, our guest of today, Annette Becker, director of the Texas Fashion Collection at the University of North Texas in the College of Visual Arts and Design. Hey, Annette, how are you? Wonderful. Thank you for having me, Leon. I'm going to say a little bit about you and then we can dive in. Um, Annette has earned her BA in Art History in English and an MA in Art History with a minor in Art Education. Um, uh, and namely, she, I'm sorry, she often found herself working with elite art forms and one of the most accessible forms of design in history, namely dress. As a student uh, herself at UNT, she saw how the collection housed garments representing a wide range of lived experiences and in public university that serves a great number of first generation students and students of color. Becker particularly hopes that all visitors and viewers can find reflections of their own lives in the collection and in turn better understand that of others. And a little bit about the collection, the Texas Fashion Collection recently begun to explore links between design and cultural histories and helping people think more accurately and pretty acutely about their personal and collective relationships to dress. Um, the TFC does not have a dedicated exhibition space, but their exhibitions are mounted in cultural spaces around the country. Uh, uh, Annette has um, been working with and lends itself, lends herself and her work um, to uh, small and um, other organizations and her team works on curating and installing exhibitions, creating educational programming and engaging with stakeholders, mentoring students and cataloging artifacts. So at, since the beginning, uh, and as director since 2016, the collection has built up its representation on the University of North Texas digital library um, up to over 8,300 8, artifacts represented by 52,000 images. We will discuss digitization at some point. And all are freely available and reproducible for educational and nonprofit purposes. With that, welcome, Annette. It's so good to see you. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Leon. It's wonderful to be here with a bunch of friendly faces and names and colleagues from around the country. Um, so I'm really glad we can have this sense of community together here. I'm super excited to talk about the collection. I've heard a lot about it over the years. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, you know, I'm just going to say what I said before we started the program. I'm digging the drawings behind you. So. <laughs> Yes, um, I, I feel lucky that we do have um, some paper ephemera relating to our collection that are not accessioned artifacts. So this is my office and we have a few illustrations by Fred Greenhill behind me. Um, so I'm really grateful that to augment our understanding of our material artifacts, our garments and accessories, that we do have some fashion illustrations here as well. Nice. And I forgot to mention that our drink of tonight is the Paloma a delicious, wonderful moment in time with tequila. And that recipe will be posted in the chat. So, you know, take a time and go shake up a cocktail. That is why we have dress and drinks. Great. Well, cheers. <laughs> exactly. Cheers. All right. So, and that take it away. Let's see what you've got to talk about. Everything is more fun. Um, when we have images to look at too. So right. again, my name's Annette Becker. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I serve as the director of the Texas Fashion Collection. Um, we are an archive of nearly 20,000 historic and designer garments and accessories. Wow. So on the screen, you can see a photograph of just one aisle in our massive collection storage space, which is our primary facility um, here on UNT's campus. We're really grateful to have this context at an academic institution uh, because that really drives a lot of the work that we do, making sure that our collection is accessible to researchers of a lot of different backgrounds. Um, our collection is also housed within the College of Visual Arts and Design. So historically, our collection has really had um, a design thrust and has been cast as a design research resource. Um, but especially now that I'm working on a PhD in history, I'm also thinking a lot about um, cultural history stories that can be told with our artifacts. So really expanding the narratives that exist within our nearly 20,000 pieces. 
That's amazing. I have to tell you, as a costume designer, this looks like the warehouse at Warner Brothers or Western Costume. It's like I want to get on a rolling rack and start like pawing through it. Yeah, I a lot of people when they come in their space, it really re reminds me, them of some costume shop sort of behind the scenes spaces. Um, and honestly, I think sometimes they're disappointed that um, as an archivist, I don't let people handle our pieces in the same way people handle costume stock. Um, but luckily, that means that these things will last fa far further in the future. Um, and a lot of that really has to do with um, our collection being now a more professional organization. Um, we were initially started in 1938 by the Dallas based department store Neiman Marcus. Um, so oh, here you can see a few photos that represent some of those early um, days of the TFC being formed. So Neiman Marcus, based in Dallas, was founded in 1907. And to celebrate their 30th anniversary and a shift in leadership at Neiman Marcus, um, two brothers, Stanley and Edward Marcus, decided they wanted to do a few things to document the store's um, history. One of them was starting the Neiman Marcus Award, which was cast as the Oscars of fashion. And here you can see some photographs of some of the people who won the Neiman Marcus Award. Um, on the left, we have a photograph of Jacques Foth um, fitting a dress onto a model with Stanley Marcus standing to the left, you know, sort of like knowingly observing a process that I'm sure as a retailer, he actually knew nothing about draping fabric. But, you know, it's all, all for the theater, right? <laughs> Um, and then on the right, we have a photograph of sweet baby Yves Saint Laurent um, receiving the Neiman Marcus Award in 1958, the, the, the year he took over as the head of the House of Dior. So um, the Neiman Marcus Award was given to these designers. Um, they came to Dallas to receive it, and they were celebrated with a lot of festivities, with fashion shows. And Neiman Marcus collected pieces that were shown in those fashion shows that were for sale in their store. Um, so the Neiman Marcus Award was started at the same time as this fashion art archive, um, really having that grounding in retail and in fashion design, fashion creation, fashion consumerism um, has really driven a lot of our collecting practices and shaped what we have in our holdings. Wait, so you're telling me I can come visit you and you will have an Yves Saint Laurent uh, from 1958 House of Dior that is just sort of like hanging out waiting to be played with? It's really incredible. We're so lucky that these retailers whose jobs was really, you know, their jobs were really to get pieces in their store to sell, that they decided to hold on to some of those things as contemporary garments, knowing they would be important to us as fashion historians in the future. So those pieces range from Christian Dior receiving the Neiman Marcus Award in 1947 when his house was opened. You know, there's an entire chapter in Dior's autobiography about coming to Texas to receive the Neiman Marcus Award. Um, and he speaks disparagingly, disparagingly about barbecue um, in that chapter. So, you know, maybe Texas and Neiman Marcus aren't exactly for everyone all the way, but it's uh, still pretty interesting thinking about the ways that um, Dallas, which isn't often seen as a fashion capital, um, really engaged with um, national and global fashion perspectives and, and figures. Yeah, that's, and that's really shaped our holdings. Um, so for example, um, our collection has one of the world's biggest uh, holdings in pieces by Hane Mori. Um, she's a fashion figure who I think has um, a kind of been marginalized, um, partially because I think she was a transitional figure in Japanese fashion history. Um, one of the first Japanese fashion designers to sell her work outside of Japan. And Neiman Marcus was one of the first stores in the US to, to showcase her work. Um, she was also the first non-Euro-American designer to receive the Neiman Marcus Award, um, I think in 1973. Um, the photograph of um, the, the piece on the right that um, has Mount Fuji and cherry blossoms on it, I think was likely commissioned by um, Billy Marcus, who was Stanley Marcus's wife, um, to wear when Hana Mori came to Dallas to receive the Neiman Marcus Award. Um, Hana Mori, several years later, went on to be the first Asian designer to have a couture practice in Paris. So it's kind of a, a point of pride that our, our Denton and Dallas, Texas history can really be a stepping so stone in this history of a Japanese fashion designer going from Japan to Paris. Paris. These are fantastic. Um, the one that you point out with Mount Fuji, is that a shawl that is draping around or is that the sleeves of the garment? What is going on with that? That's amazing. 
Um, so with that piece, it's actually both. The construction of this hostess dress um, both includes a shawl that's separate, but then also long kimono style sleeves. So uncut pieces of fabric treated basically as yardage um, connected at the arm's eye, but then just loose otherwise. Um, so it's a really lovely example of Hanamori combining Euro-American aesthetics, you know, an affinity for mumus and hostess dresses um, with kimono construction um, and that, you know, respect and reverence for textiles. Awesome. Those are beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're, we're so lucky to have those in our collection. Um, a lot of Neiman Marcus clients have also really shaped what we have in our holdings. Um, we're really well known for our holdings in um, pieces by Cristobal Balenciaga. We have nearly 300 in our collection, um, and a lot of research has been conducted on those um, by our former director, Myra Walker, who is a, a lifelong CSA member and still a really active um, person in our organization and at the Texas Fashion Collection. Um, this is one of the most lovely examples of Balenciaga pieces we have in our holdings. Um, a piece of haute couture made of velvet with a bustle covered in hundreds of ermine tails. And the donor noted when she donated this piece to us that um, Balenciaga gave her extra, a little bag of extra ermine tails in case any of them fell off, um, which is, you know, a delightful story to have. Um, also, considering the history of ermine and its associations with royalty in Europe, it's pretty easy to tell what this, you know, tech who came from a middle-class family that struck oil, you know, how she really thought of herself as a lifelong, um, you know, worshiper of Balenciaga, that she both had this incredible wardrobe of hundreds of pieces of haute couture by him, but also she was, you know, interested in wearing ermine and showing people really what her status was as Texas royalty. That's fantastic. And I'm just going to say, like, to have mm, ermine tails on well, let's just call it a fishtail bustle, which it's really not, just for, you know, <laughs> sake of alliteration. Hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a pretty delightful piece. Um, yeah, it's really beautiful. Um, it's of gorgeous. course... Um, as, as you mentioned in describing the Texas fashion collection, we don't only have pieces that represent the most elite fashion. Um, this is one of my favorite pieces in our collection, and it really relates to um, how a lot of collections function. We don't actually know who made this piece or even who donated it or when it came into our holdings. Um, but through looking at the materials, we've been able to parse out some of the, the history of this piece. Um, I wonder if you all might want to go to your chats right now and guess what you think this piece is made of. Um, it has a really humble origin. Um, so you might be able to see in the photos that there is glitter that's been attached to the primary material. We can also see sequins um, and maybe a small link from a bracelet, something like that. Um, the main material, I think, is really surprising. Um, so you're welcome to go to the chat if you have any guesses. Uh, as a hint, the reason this is my very favorite piece in our collection um, is because I grew up on a farm, and this is a material that's really familiar to me from that. Um, so we have uh, some um, suggestions, bobby pins. We have quite a few pieces, get, people guessing chicken, chicken wire. wire. So I wish I could pass gold stars to all of the chicken wire guesses. As soon as you said the farm thing, I was like, chicken wire, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, the, this piece uh, really touches me in a, a deep way. I grew up in a small town in rural western Kansas. I did not grow up with access to Balenciaga and, you know, the really elite designers represented in our collection. But I sure grew up with chicken wire, and I definitely grew up with that feeling of wanting to um, be glamorous or elevate moments of my life above, you know, the sort of everyday and humdrum. And... I could imagine someone in the 1930s getting these materials and feeling like they wanted to be special for a day and making this for themselves. And it's really through having a piece like this that I can really, you know, I can connect with this in a deeply personal way um, that I can then start understanding the ideas of, you know, glamour and wanting to feel special that are embodied in other pieces in our collection. And I really hope everyone who conducts research in our collection is able to find something that resonates with them so deeply. That's fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, one other set of materials I wanted to share with you all, you know, we could do collection highlights today through next week if we wanted to, um, but as a, a last set of materials, uh, we recently were gifted a set of objects that primarily relate to 18th century menswear. Um, so there's a photograph on the right of a, a gentleman, um, one of the donors, Scott Gentling. Um, he is dressed in 18th century garb, and you would not believe that this photo was taken in the 1980s in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, so Scott and Stuart Gentling were brothers who were primarily professional artists, uh, but they also collected historic menswear. Um, so you can see a photograph on the right of um, a coordinated um, embroidered coat, vest, and um, pants um, that were all part of an 18th century ensemble they donated. Um, they all, their estate also donated um, the piece you can see in the middle, which I personally think is one of the most disgusting looking things in our collection. Um, it's a Roman sandal, which is now made of petrified leather that likely dates from between the years three and 400. Um, so this piece is now by far the oldest artifact in our collection. Um, people often ask what the oldest thing is, and I think they don't often realize that it's something that's practically like archeological remains and maybe not quite as beautiful or glamorous as you would expect. <laughs> uh, but it something... is the test of time. Agreed, agreed, agreed. And we're, we're grateful to have it in our collection. Um, something I really appreciate about having these materials from the Gentling brothers is that we can interpret them um, not only in the moment that those 18th century artifacts were created, thinking about um, the tailors, the embroiderers, the people who um, wove that incredible luxurious velvet, um, but we can also think about how these objects have had lives over the past 250 years since then. Um, so in this slide, you can see um, in the middle um, a reproduction of one of the Gentling brothers um, still lives. So the brothers would purchase these pieces not only to wear, but also to use as props in their studio practice, which brings a new layer of meaning to these materials. Um, you can then also see on the left a photograph that the brothers created of um, the, the famous American artist Ed Ruscha. Um, apparently he did a studio visit with them. Um, they took a few quick photographs of him wearing this piece and then um, created pencil sketches reproducing them. Um, so it's interesting um, seeing how this piece that as dress historians we might first interpret the, this piece from the 18th century but remembering that the story continues beyond that moment of creation is important that's a stunning coat it's really really beautiful the embroidery is just amazing it's, it is really incredible. Um, yeah, looking at the embroidery and some of the pieces they donated is really fascinating. Um, so this is a photo I took of another um, 18th century coat that they donated. Um, if you look closely at the buttons, you might notice that there are slight differences between the two. Um, so what some uh, an intervention from the brothers is that if some buttons were missing um, buttons made of um, the self fabric that were very carefully embroidered and then crafted into these um, buttons that were largely decorative if some of them were missing they got wooden discs and used their painting skills to reproduce them so the button on the right is original and the button on the left is one that the gentling brothers created um, and that really poses some interesting questions about how we think about, you know, a point of creation in pieces, how we might even think about conservation for these artifacts. Do we want these objects to only represent the moment of creation, or is the Gentling Brothers story with this piece important enough to have acidic painted wood right next to this textile? Well, and you're right, that poses a really interesting converse, you know, debate in that in terms of, uh, you know, thinking about what that is and how to conserve those and how to conserve the piece mm -hmm. now with these, you know, very different and usual mixed materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's a really fascinating conundrum, which moments in history do we prioritize with our interpretation and with conservation? Um, and I really love that, especially through the Costume Society of America, we have um, this set of colleagues to really ha grapple with these issues and have conversations about, you know, the many right ways of handling something like this. Yeah, it makes me grateful to have uh, everyone who's here and beyond. <laughs> 
Um, so what I've shared so far are some of the artifacts we have in our collection. Of course, we need to have ways of making these accessible to people. Um, as you mentioned, Leon, the Texas Fashion Collection does not have its own dedicated exhibition space. So we tend to partner with cultural institutions, um, primarily in Texas, but really around the country to make our collection more accessible. Um, one of our favorite partners for exhibitions um, and an institution that we've had uh, nearly a decade long relationship with is North Park Center in Dallas. Um, so this shows a photograph of one of our exhibitions called West Dressed, the history of um, American fashions inspired by the frontier. Uh, so North Park Center is a, a shopping space in Dallas that was built in 1965 and is run by the Nasher family. Um, they have a robust art collection and they really frame the shopping center as a space to engage with the art of fashion. Um, so in that area, um, in their space, you can see original Warhol prints, you can see um, Shapiro sculptures, and then once a year, um, we mount exhibitions um, in their space. North Park sees something like 29 million visitors a year, is free of charge to visit, is open seven days a week, um, is along public transportation lines. So if we're really thinking about making our collection accessible, you know, a shopping center might not be the first place most people would expect to engage engage with dress history, um, but it's a really powerful one. Um, for this exhibition and the other ones that we've curated in this space, we tend to um, curate projects that are thematic so people who don't have a background in fashion history can still understand what's going on. Um, the exhibitions tend to relate to a current fashion trend so that when people are shopping for things in stores, they can relate what they're seeing in our exhibition to their own consumer purchases. Um, and we tend to try to think about um, sort of cultural conversations that are going on and ones that would be meaningful to people who are visiting this space. Um, so especially since there's a sort of like cowboys and Indians um, understanding of uh, Texas, um, that's one of the reasons that we mounted this exhibition that's really focused on um, sort of like Western wear and pieces inspired um, that I guess have some sort of um, indigenous creation related to them. Um, there's a question in the chat about how lighting is controlled in this space. Um, so so we, the lighting levels are higher in this space than I think most um, professional galleries would allow. And we really think carefully about what pieces we put on display in this area. Um, so the pieces we share at North Park tend to be more contemporary pieces that were made um, with synthetic dyes that are more light fast. And um, we also have pretty strict limits about how long these things can be on view at North Park to make sure that they're, um, you know, still in good condition for people in the future. Um, but also, you know, and anyone managing an archive is sort of balancing preservation with access. Um, so in any exhibition, you're choosing to potentially damage pieces by mounting them, by exposing them to any level of light, by handling them. Um, and, but we decide that those exhibitions are worthwhile because we're saving these pieces for a reason. Um, they need to have some impact be, besides being in a cold, dark storage space. Um, so because North Park creates such um, access and visibility for our collection, um, we have made the strategic decision um, to allow our pieces to be in a space that isn't as you know, controlled as a lot of professional galleries are. Um, I'm sure people in the future might have uh, make other decisions in our collection, but I'm pretty pleased with um, our decision right now. Um, there's another question about when our next exhibition at North Park will be. Um, so we have a tradition of uh, mounting them every spring. On um, the spring, we're pausing, and our next exhibition will, with them will be next spring. Um, we have a project in the works that I think should be pretty interesting that relates to um, the history of embroidery creating in India. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that because you'll have to come see the exhibition. <laughs> or buy the book. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, and this exhibition um, that we mounted um, West Dressed, uh, I think was it was really loved by people who saw it, um, partially because there is such a connection with, um, you know, ideas of Western wear and Texas. Um, those ideas have really been consciously cultivated. Um, so you'll see on the right a photograph of Stanley Marcus, the former CEO of Neiman Marcus, um, standing next to a fashion figure many of you all might recognize 
recognize, that's Coco Chanel. Um, she came to Dallas in 1957 to receive the Neiman Marcus Award, and Stanley Marcus greeted her wearing this kind of ridiculous looking Western style suit. Um, you'll see in the photograph on the left that all the embroidery is in bright pink and green. Um, there are butterflies, um, which are the one of the logos for Neiman Marcus, and Coco Chanel, I think, looks very bemused in this photo. Um, that was a, a sort of, um, I don't know, a way that I think she approached much of her visit. Uh, later in the evening when this photograph was taken, um, Stanley Marcus hosted a Western style party that Coco Chanel attended, which included a pistol shooting demonstration, um, barbecue, which she did not like eating either, um, and a bovine fashion show that included cows wearing top hats and pearl necklaces. Um, so <laughs> clearly there's a way that this sort of, um, you know, Western, these Western tropes have been cultivated here um, to really, I think, create a sense of place. But, you know, Stanley Marcus is also, you know, savvy in his marketing, is really interested in people really feeling a sense of place in Dallas and in Texas. Um, so I think our exhibition sort of um, playing off that is really historically keeping in line with our, our collection's history. Yeah, he's um, clearly a showman. Exactly, exactly. Um, I also really love that in thinking um, through what this exhibition could include, um, that I realized we had no pieces by known indigenous designers um, from the US in our collection. So because we receive um, funding from North Park Center to create these exhibitions, we were able to use part of that money to purchase pieces by contemporary indigenous makers, um, both to feature in this exhibition and then to permanently include in our collection. So you'll see a photograph on the left, which includes uh, the piece in blue that's digitally printed. Um, that's by Jamie Akuma, who's really best known for her really intricate beadwork and translating that beadwork into digitally printed designs, which makes her um, connection with this historic craft both speak to technology today and be more accessible to more people. Um, you'll also see a photo on the right of a piece by Marissa Mike. Um, she is based in Tuba City, Arizona, and makes these incredible special occasion dresses out of Pendleton wool blankets, um, which she cuts into really intricate pattern pieces and then recreates these really beautiful dresses. Um, so we're really lucky that she was able to make space in her making schedule um, and her roster of clients to make a piece for this exhibition that now researchers can come to our space to appreciate. Those are really stunning. That blue is just gorgeous. Yeah, it's it's really beautiful. And I love that, you know, we were not only able to celebrate these designers work in this really public way, but we're also holding on to these and making sure that their stories are celebrated into the future. Um, luckily, no trash has ever been deposited over the um, the plexi barriers in this space. Um, there is really high security in this area. Um, so for context, um, North Park Center includes um, fast fashion spaces, they have a food court. Um, but the area that we we tend to mount our exhibitions in is between a Tiffany and a Louis Vuitton. Um, so you can imagine that there are there's a lot of surveillance there, um, which is another reason that we feel comfortable having our artifacts there. Um, there are also staff that are constantly um, dusting, sweeping, making sure that the space is really, um, you know, um, approachable for fashion consumers, but then also really safe for our artifacts. Um, we have another question about, um, do we have catalogs for our exhibitions? Um, we tend not to because our staffing is so limited here, um, but we do make a point of sharing our exhibition materials um, online through um, a digital portal, and I'd be happy to share um, information about that. So I wanted to share a few other examples of places that our collection has been shared. Um, as you mentioned, we work with a lot of um, partnering cultural institutions. So on the left, you can see a photograph of an exhibition we fairly recently mounted at the El Paso Museum of Art. That was um, that museum's very first fashion exhibition. So it was really incredible working with them to make our collection accessible to a new audience. I'm um, working with the staff there who are some of the most enthusiastic and professional people I've ever engaged 
with. Um, it was really lovely making our collection matter to a new group of people. Um, we do also lend pieces in sort of like a one-off kind of way for projects. Um, so most recently we loaned um, a piece by Hubert de Givenchy for the most recent um, summer exhibition that was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, so in this photograph, you can see the white piece with the ostrich feather sort of draped over it on this very dramatic mannequin um, that looks like it's being palmed in the face by another mannequin wearing a blue piece, I think by Halston. And I believe that piece was lent by um, FIDM in LA. Uh, so it's really lovely that, you know, the Met makes a point of borrowing pieces from a lot of different institutions that our collection could be highlighted in this way, and especially highlighted alongside, you know, a collection run by other CSA members. Um, if you all are interested in seeing our uh, materials beyond exhibitions, um, as Leon mentioned, we have made a point of digitizing our collection. So right now you can see nearly 8,500 pieces online through the UNT Digital Library. Um, and if you sort just by what has been added most recently, you can see pieces from a variety of time periods, um, a wide range of makers, um, different sizes. Um, we've made a point of purchasing mannequins in sizes 2, 8, and 12. And then, of course, we pad out mannequins to really appropriately show um, the, the bodies that were meant to be in the pieces in our collection. Um, one of my favorite things about our digitization project is that we really think about the information people would want to have about you know, a, a piece in our collection. Um, so this piece has been photographed um, 52 times and all of those are made available online. You can see multiple angles of pieces in our collection. And then for this really fun Charles James piece, you might not realize the hips are kind of full. And that's because um, Charles James included padding around um, the butt and hips of this piece. Um, so it's really a point of pride um, for us in digitizing our holdings that we're thinking about, especially what makers might need to know about how these pieces are constructed. And we're trying to document that, you know, um, I know we've probably all had experience of experiences of shopping online and seeing one photo of something and thinking like, I really don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that is. And if we're going to take the time to put one of our pieces on a mannequin and photograph it, we might as well get 52 images of that thing. <laughs> Well, exactly. I mean, uh, you know, uh, there are several of us, uh, and you know, in the organization that are doing this work and and re using it as research in terms of trying to like make the connection between people who are searching online and trying to find these images. You know, the portal. Uh, project has been something that is CSA has been talking about for a while. So mm -hmm. you are really on the forefront of it. And I will be talking with you later um, and bringing you into uh, into this fold around digitization, because um, there are so many conversations that we need to talk about around metadata mm -hmm. and what's actually put in. And I love that you brought up the idea around how people are searching for fashion online, because that's really a key aspect, just mm -hmm. in terms of the nomenclature of what we are putting in versus what people are actually using to search for. But that's a whole other webinar and and an upcoming presentation at the CSA Symposium in May. <laughs> wink, wink. I love that. I love that. Well, I will I will be there in Salt Lake City, so I can't wait to um, to to attend and participate in that dialogue. Awesome. Um, yeah, digit digitizing collections is cr of critical importance. Um, I think especially considering the Texas Fashion Collections institutional um, situation, like we are at a public state university. Um, UNT is known as a Hispanic serving and minority serving institution. And I think 40% of our students are first generation college students. Like our collection needs to be accessible um, to people. Um, so, you know, it's important to do that in as many ways as possible. And one of them is through digitization. Um, yeah. yeah. It's also a point of pride to me. Um, let's see, I'll click through to the next slide. Um, it's a point of pride to me. You can see in this photograph, the people who are responsible for those incredible images of that Charles James piece. Um, so on the left, you'll see a photograph of 
I think are pretty fun loving staff. Um, so this is a photograph of our staff from um, the fall semester. Um, so our permanent staff are include me and then Ailey, um, who can be seen just to the, the left of the, the mannequin in the middle. And then everyone else in that photograph, those are all students at the University of North Texas. Um, so, you know, that ranges from people who are freshmen all the way up through grad students, um, students studying fashion design, interdisciplinary art and design studies. Um, Andrew, the, the person who's shown in the bottom right, he's a photography student and he's the one who actually shot and edited those photos of that Charles James piece. Like you would not imagine that a 22 year old took such incredible images. Um, you know, oh, we're yeah. really lucky to have these in, the, these people with incredible talent in our space um, and that they're willing to lend those talents and develop their talents um, at the TFC is really a pleasure. That's amazing. That's a great way of including students in this. That's so fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really love how much students tend to expand the ways that even I think about the professional work I do. Um, so because the Texas Fashion Collection doesn't have dedicated exhibition space, we're constantly inviting research groups in to conduct um, research appointments. Um, so you can see on the right here a photograph of some students gathered around a table looking at a Masoni sweater and um, sort of like trying to figure out how this piece was created. Um, because I'm trained as an art historian and cultural historian, I don't have um, such, such a depth of knowledge about a lot of making techniques. So it's incredible to me to get to be around people like this who really have a depth of knowledge that I can learn from. Um, you'll also see a photograph on the right. We had a group of junior high students um, who came in. The, um, the students on the right side of the table were sketching based on the descriptions that the student on the left side of the table were giving them of a piece in our collection. So we were really thinking about the ways that, you know, verbal descriptions are really important for um, really focusing on material details of objects. But then also if we're thinking about maybe working with groups of people who have visual impairment, visual description is especially important. Um, so these yeah. are skills that we can develop not only to help ourselves as researchers, but to make a lot of material more accessible to more people. Uh, we also have um, students who help teach in our space. Um, so this semester, um, Catherine, who's a graduate student in art history, um, has helped teach some Osher Lifelong Learning Institute sessions. Um, here you can see some photographs of her um, talking about mount making and properly storing pieces in our collection. Um, so it's lovely sort of decentering even my own curatorial expertise um, and having grad students present their expertise too. Um, we yes. also do that. Um, and exhibitions. So this is an example um, from an exhibition we had just last year. Um, there was a course at UNT that was focused on the Texas Fashion Collection and students selected individual pieces that they wrote short presentations on that they shared with a group of visitors. Um, so this student, um, looked at this piece by Oscar de la Renta from Balmain, one of the first, one of a piece from one of his first collections as the head of this historic couture house. And he looked at that and did not first see Oscar de la Renta. He thought about his grandmother and the sewing that he watched her do when he was a child and connected her work as a seamstress to this, you know, moment in really elite fashion history. And I think um, moments like this are really what makes me love my job and makes me love of working with a collection like this, that there are so many ways of interpreting pieces. There are so many stories that uh, can exist within dress history. And if we allow um, artifacts and people to have the space to tell those stories, um, we can come to a deeper understanding of the, the many textures that humanity has. That is so true. Thank you, Annette. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get on my soapbox a little bit. <laughs> get on it, get on it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so if we have a few minutes here, um, I thought maybe I could get on my phone um, and we could um, do a very brief tour of collection storage and look Great. at a few pieces that we saw. So I just walked from my office into the Texas Fashion Collection storage space. Um, we do have um, our permanent collections stored here. You can see these very tall racks that access with um, rolling ladders. Yes, um, most exactly. Wow. 
yeah, there's a lot to see in here. Um, so most of our collection is organized uh, alphabetically by designer or design house. Um, I think that largely has to do um, with our collections history with Neiman Marcus, which is a really designer forward space, um, as well as our current context in the College of Visual Arts and Design at the University of North Texas. Um, so really thinking about designers as creative individuals and personalities that should be celebrated. Um, however, a big portion of our collection is not organized by designer because designer is not the only way that we understand pieces. Um, so if we move back to the front, we'll see pieces um, organized chronologically by decade. So here we start in the 1780s and go all the way down to the 19 teens in this very front row. Excellent. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot in here. Um, I am approaching 10 years um, at the Texas Fashion Collection, and I feel like every time I go back in the collection storage, I see something new and exciting. Well, new. <laughs> so how often do you, I mean, are you still collecting and, and taking things in? Absolutely. Um, so even just last week, I went to meet with a few donors to add artifacts to our collection. Um, so right now, we're really focused on thinking about what's already in our holdings and what's missing, especially when we think about um, our current audiences, the people we'd like to serve, um, the gaps that exist in fashion history because of past institutional biases. Um, so right now, one of the areas we're really um, focusing on collecting is menswear, because historically, a lot a lot of collections have not included much of it. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, and it's so rare that there's a whole menswear exhibition. You mm -hmm. know, it has been what? Oh gosh, 20 years? A long time. I'm making that number up. Since, mm -hmm. um, you know, prior to LACMA's uh, Reigning Men exhibition a few years mm -hmm. ago. Um, so yeah, so that's amazing. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done with that. Um, in 2020, the TFC um, curated an exhibition of menswear. Um, it was the very first menswear project we'd had here in our collection's nearly 50 year history. Um, wow. Honestly, it was a struggle to put that together because our menswear holdings were so limited. And I was really grateful to have that as a curatorial project to have an excuse to focus on that and to acquire some new pieces for our holdings. Nice. Um, yeah. Excellent. What else do you want to show us? Okay, so I thought I'd show you just quickly. This is where we conduct collection digitization. So you can see that we have um, a large roll of backdrop paper. We use this dark blue for lighter colored pieces in our collection and then white for darker colored pieces. Um, we have a really simple lighting setup and then our photographer uses a full frame camera. And you can see we have a small army of mannequins um, that we rotate out. Um, yeah, just choosing whichever one is most appropriate for the style of garment, the size of the garment, you know, its moment in history. Um, and I'm gonna switch my camera around. Oops. Sorry, there we go. Um, and show you, we also have a table here that we use um, both for um, dressing and undressing our mannequins, but then also for object study. So especially wow. since I showed you all some photographs of that 18th century um, velvet embroidered coat, I thought I'd bring us in a bit closer. That is fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's really breathtaking. Um, we're lucky to have pieces like this that were all sewn by hand, um, created with natural dyes. Um, really thinking about what menswear has looked like historically, um, I think helps us maybe understand in a different way current trends for, for example, florals and menswear um, in a sort of like color renaissance. Yeah. And how flat menswear has become. It used to be very dimensional. Um, I have a I have a special request since you're at that coat. I love yes. uh, like can you lift up the pocket flap? I like seeing underneath Ooh. things. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I will admit I did not wash my hands after having a snack earlier. So I'm going to grab a glove really quickly, um, and then I'll switch the camera back around. Yes, please okay. no Cheetos. Please no Cheetos on the on the. <laughs> Oh, really lovely. Yeah, so we're lucky. Um, this piece really hasn't faded very much, but many of our other 18th century menswear pieces, lifting up the pocket is a great way to see the color the textile used to be. Yeah. Yeah, this is an incredible shape. Um, and then if I could be a little self-indulgent, we'll scoot over a few feet 
and I pulled out that chicken wire tiara. It's my very favorite. So since fantastic. I love it now, you all have to love it too. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love it. As a costume designer, I use a lot of mixed materials and unusual materials in my design work. I have never used chicken wire, but I have used any number of other kinds of wire and mesh. So I now, I'm now like, ooh, chicken wire. <laughs> right, and exactly. I, I think this is exactly why collections like this exist, is to inspire creativity, whether it's in, um, you know, creating new costumes, new fashion designs, and inspiring research. Um, you know, seeing pieces from the past, I think, jar our brains in a way and remind us that there are other ways of being and making besides the ones that we see every day. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much. You're, that's a beautiful storage facility and, and really great um, workroom as well. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so we have a few questions. Um, mm -hmm. One is, um, does, does your collection include pieces not from designer labels? That's a great question. Um, so I would say probably a little over half of our pieces are by known designers. Um, those designers range everywhere from, um, you know, Chanel and Dior to Clara of Mineral Wells, um, someone who I think was likely a teenager who made labels for the clothes that she was creating in the 1950s for her and her friends. Um, so we do have makers of a pretty wide variety documented here. Um, we even have um, listed in our database Grandma as one of our designers because someone <laughs> just made up that their grandma um, created the piece for them. Um, so, you know, known designers can take a lot of different sh forms, I guess. Um, there are a lot of pieces in our collection that we don't know the maker. Um, sometimes those are pieces that um, we know the retailer, the manufacturer, um, you know, they might be more historic pieces from before a time when um, designers were celebrated for their work with labels and, and objects. Um, we also have um, some pieces in our collection that are grounded in more like um, traditional ways of making dress or, uh, or a part of cultural practices. Um, so, for example, kimonos don't often have known makers because um, whoever made those was not separating themselves out as the most important person in that piece being made. Um, so our collection does include some of those. Um, right now we're really working on um, also thinking more broadly about who has contributed to the pieces in our collection being important. So not only designers, but also textile designers. Um, the retailers make a really big difference. Also being more um, conscious and conscientious of um, former owners of pieces and how they have changed how we understand pieces in our collection too. Um, I think really decent centering some of those really um, elite figures in our objects history is important. Nice. There's another question from Margaret. Um, how extensive are the meta tags for the costume that has mm -hmm. been digitized? That's really good. a really good question. Um, so right now we have a fair amount of metadata associated with all of our artifacts. Um, every single one, at least in theory, <laughs> um, is documented in our database, though I think everyone who runs a collection knows there's a box squirreled away somewhere with pieces that you have no clue <laughs> when they entered the collection. Um, I think it's a, a kind of dirty secret that people who run archives and museums, we, we all know this, but often people who don't work in our spaces um, are are less aware of that. Um, so for most of our pieces, we have documented um, who donated the pieces, when they donated them, um, often a date, um, information about the maker and retailer. And then we write object descriptions that just um, describe the textile, um, construction techniques, uh, materials, and then in working with the UNT Digital Library, we've been working on adding keywords from controlled vocabularies to make pieces more findable um, and also to be able to um, make the keywords associated with objects translated to different languages too, to make them even more accessible. Um, even earlier today, I had a conversation with my colleague Ailey about creating finding guides um, to help people understand more of the context to the collecting um, that has gone on here. So so we're constantly thinking um, more about what information people need to have about our collection so we can also think about more information we need to be collecting um, as we take in more artifacts. 
That's incredible. That is awesome. I mean, that work is so important in, in order to truly about the accessibility of it and thinking about how those things connect with each other. Um, mm -hmm. A few more comments and some questions. Uh, I have one quickly. Um, do you also collect like patterns, like paper patterns that may mm -hmm. accompany some of the garments that you have? Um, and then a comment is, from Andrea. Just today in class, we talked about how small menswear is compared to other areas in dress. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so those are great questions and comments. Um, our collection includes about a thousand paper patterns, and we have digitized the front and backs of all of the envelopes for those, which you can find through the UNT Digital Library. Um, we were not able to digitize the actual paper patterns, um, partially out of concerns for violating copyright for those pieces. But if a researcher was really interested in a pattern, we'd be able to photograph that and send them to send that information to them, or they could physically come to our space and make a copy of it if they wanted to use it. Um, oh. Interestingly, we've also found a few paper patterns. Um, one that comes to mind is a Calvin Klein dress that was donated from his archive, and we have the paper pattern for the exact same piece. Wow. So getting to see how that design was translated for home sewers, the photograph on the envelope to see how it was styled, and then have the material thing, um, having that sort of like synergy of, uh, of those research materials materials is really um, energizing and exciting. <laughs> That's very um, and, cool. Yeah, and it's encouraging hearing that um, someone attending is also noticing the the dearth of menswear um, that we need, we need. We need to stand up for the men in our spaces, too. <laughs> well, we have so many fewer things to wear, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been, I'm not a huge, I mean, I love designing suits. I mm -hmm. hate wearing suits. So I'm trying to figure out what the new version of a men's suit is. Um, so oh. I can wear it for myself and in professional scenarios. But that's my own personal thing at the moment. Um, a few other comments and questions. Um, you mentioned purchasing items for the collection. Please talk a little bit about your funding. That's a great question. Um, so we have relatively little funding. Um, I feel lucky that um, my salary and most of the salary of our collection manager are covered by the university. Um, but generally speaking, we have to fundraise for most of the things that we do here. Um, luckily, that doesn't include paying the electricity bill. The university covers that. Um, but we do have to fundraise to pay our interns, um, to purchase acid-free tissue, um, to be able to bring in guest lectures, and to, um, to purchase pieces to add to our collection. And we're really grateful for the donors that we have. Um, many of them give between, you know, $100 and $1,000, which to many of them is a large amount of money. And I'm really grateful that, um, you know, sort of keeping in line with the grassroots and, and accessibility work that we do here, um, that a lot of our donors really understand that and they're making decisions with the funds they have to support that. Um, for acquiring artifacts and purchasing them, um, we tend to do that mostly for exhibitions because that's when we have a budget to do something like that. Um, but also now that we have a regular pool of donors um, contributing to our funds, um, we are able to purchase more pieces. Um, most of those tend to be um, things that really relate to exhibitions or research that's going on on campus. Um, so a lot of students are really interested in digital printing. They're interested um, in you know digital fabrication. Um, I'm really interested in adding more streetwear to our collection, um, more pieces by designers of color, especially since most of our students are people of color. It's really important to have our objects sort of reflect back some of the subjectivities that they, you know, embody themselves. Um, and to be transparent, a lot of the pieces we purchase, we get from places like eBay and Etsy. We buy secondhand clothing the same places that fashion consumers do, um, because that's really, I think, a, a dynamic market. Um, and I feel really grateful that there are places like that and that as a pretty nimble and responsive collecting institution that we can make use of eBay. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Were there mm -hmm. uh, a lot of designer pieces donated by Neiman Marcus, Stanley Marcus? Mm -hmm. That's a, a great question. So the original Neiman Marcus collection included several hundreds of pieces, um, but unfortunately, many of them um, 
were damaged during a fire that happened at the downtown Neiman store in 1964. Um, and after that point, the collection left Neiman's, um, had one more institutional home before it came to UNT. Um, so the original Neiman Marcus collection includes about 200 pieces from them. Um, beyond that point, Neiman's has occasionally contributed pieces um, that were sort of in their storerooms that maybe were left over after a season. Um, so they have not continued to shape our collection in a really substantial way. Um, Stanley Marcus did donate a lot of his own clothing. Um, so I would say about a third of our menswear collection are pieces from Stanley and Lawrence and Edward Marcus. And honestly, as an archivist, I shake my fist at them because they did not document their own wardrobes in the way that they documented the Neiman Marcus collection pieces. <laughs> so if anyone is an expert at dating, um, for example, um, like Liberty of London next ties. Um, I will buy you all of the coffee that you can consume if you will help me date some of the menswear pieces that were donated by the Marcus family. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, a couple last questions as we start to wrap things up. Do you mm -hmm. collect accessories as well? Mm, a, a great question. Um, so our collection includes a lot of accessories. Um, we have over 2,000 hats in our collection. Um, I think we have well over 1,500 pairs of shoes. Um, we have, you know, handbags, parasols, hat pins. Um, the chicken wire tiara is one of my favorite examples. Um, we even have a, a neckerchief slide um, that was branded as a Roy Rogers piece that uh, the donor told us she got in like a cereal box when she was a child. Um, so we have, you know, the Judith Lieber handbags and we have cereal box neck neckerchief slides. Um, basically anything you can imagine someone having worn, we likely have an example of it in our collection. That's fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the last question of the evening is, do you sell or donate pieces to other institutions or people? Mm -hmm. That's a, a great question. So generally um, speaking, when things come into our collection, they stay with us. And that's really because we've developed um, trust in a relationship with a donor to steward their pieces in a way that, you know, we've sort of made a pact with them. And that's formalized in a deed of gift. Um, however, occasionally um, donors will come to us with pieces that they're interested in adding to our collection. And for one reason or another, it's they're just not great fits for our, our collection. Um, so for example, um, let's see, we have a lot of Chanel suits in our collection. Um, we have a representative collection of Chanel suits and we're quite lucky for that. If a donor were to come to us with a Chanel suit, um, I would likely say we can't take that. Um, but then I would likely put them in contact with, for example, we have some great colleagues, um, Stephanie Bailey at um, Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. She and I are in regular communication about, you know, um, what her collection needs, what our collection needs, um, just making sure that we can, um, you know, really make sure the most pieces are being saved and presented in the most responsible way. Um, there are also some things people offer us that I often um, steer them to to another institution that could more responsibly manage and make those pieces accessible. Um, so for example, the Texas Fashion Collection tends not to collect um, things that are really textile um, pieces that aren't fashion objects. Um, that's just the scope that our collection has historically had. Um, so when someone comes to me with an amazing quilt, I send them to Texas Tech and their museum because they have an incredible quilt collection. And if someone is researching quilts, that piece will have a far greater impact in a collection that has that strength. Um, so I think it's really important that as um, collectors develop themselves, they think about serving people and not just hoarding objects. Um, so really thinking about our relationship with other institutions is important. Well, and what you're talking about is having a very clear mission of collecting. So that mm -hmm. way, everybody doesn't just like swing by and drop off their wedding dress and, you know, their grandmother that they found in the cedar chest, and which every collection has three dozen of, you know, um, and so, you know, you, you sort of don't need all of them, maybe. Um, 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 in that case, so um, Annette, thank you so much. This has been really delightful and wonderful. Great collection. Thank you for the presentation. So wonderful to 
uh, to see what you have. And I look forward to coming and visiting you and I look forward to meeting you in, in person in the human form and chatting more about digitization in Salt Lake. And as we say good night, um, thank you for uh, for coming today. And, and again, thanks to Annette. Please follow the Costume Society of America on Facebook and Instagram to make sure that you hear about upcoming episodes of Conversations on Dress. Lastly, if you enjoyed today's content, we implore you to make a small or giant contribution to help keep this content free for all. Please consider giving to support Costume Society of America as we, uh, so we can continue our content for another 50 years. Thank you all so much. 